Welcome to another synth hour. And uh, as we've been doing lately, this this isn't a live show, by the way, it's uh, pre-recorded. And today for a uh, wonderful guest, I've got Mr. Brian Oliva of uh, Getsemane Music. Am I, am I pronouncing that right, Brian? Yep, perfect. And uh, Brian's been uh, pretty active on YouTube, and we've uh, enjoyed watching his videos. And uh, he's been on Geosense at least once that I know of. Have you been on more than once? Nope, just once. Episode 35. Episode 35. Okay. Yep. So I, uh, I, I've, I've wanted to talk with Brian and learn more about what, what makes him tick. And uh, I, I really enjoyed that interview. So we have him here before us. Uh, Brian, how are things going over there in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio? No, we're still here. Uh, it's been an interesting year. Uh, I'm basically living in this room for most of it. <laughs> as as uh, a shut-in like all the rest of us, huh? Yep. Uh, hair's getting long again. I had one haircut in the past 12 months. Oh, wow. So, uh, when I got so I couldn't see anymore, I finally broke down and got one. And <laughs> I'm getting close to that again, but uh, as long as I wear headphones, it keeps everything contained, so uh, I'm good. <laughs> So, so it's the uh, the quarantine hairdo, I guess you could say. Yep, a lot of that going around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I I'm still every every now and then I give Marshall a hard time because we really like that quarantine beard he had going. But uh, I don't know if a quarantine beard is your style. Uh, I avoid beards just because, you know, they get in the way for me. Well, and I, but, I'm sure uh, the, the wife might have something to say about a. Yeah, full I've, on uh, Santa Claus look. <laughs> yeah, I've almost always had a mustache, but uh, beards come and go, but uh, never really stick around too long. So since this is uh, Brian's first time on the show, we're going to delve into his past, um, as I've done with the other guests. And he's had a, had a lot of a lot of changes and a lot of different experiences. And... Uh, We'll, we'll go into more detail as to why his studio looks a little different than maybe it has in some other videos you've watched. Um, so I guess my, my first question, Brian, would be, at what point did you decide listening to music wasn't enough and maybe you wanted to make, make a little bit of noise of your own? Well, I've You don't have to say the year, time. but, you know. Oh, I don't mind. I'm, I'm not old enough that I don't, you know, that it... I object to anything yet. <laughs> uh, actually, I, Young uh, at heart. I like that. Yeah, life is good now. I'm actually 65 and I don't care. I'm starting to relive my second childhood and that's a good thing. But uh, I don't know we always had music around a little bit. You know, we had a whole 45 RPM record player and, you know, started out with kids' stuff and worked into whatever music uh, my parents and grandparents were playing. But uh, at some point way back when, uh, you know, uh, well, very first experience, I think in first grade, you know, like everybody else, I was playing a thing they called a flutophone. It's kind of like a recorder. Okay. I think probably everybody's got one of those. So that yeah, was my little... introduction to of official music, you know, playing s songs in my very first band. But uh, beyond that, uh, I don't know, at some point when I was six or seven or eight around there, uh, we got uh, the first organ in the house. And uh, if you want, I've got a... A yeah, few go pictures ahead and, of stuff I can pull up here, maybe. We'll see if our technology's working and bring Just bring that guy up. Walk you through it here. Let's see. Pictures are here. Let's get back to the beginning. No peeking. Yeah. So I found most of these on the internet because most of the stuff has been you know, dismantled or destroyed decades ago. But yeah. Uh, Somewhere in the uh, in the middle 1960s, this became my first organ. This is a Magnus chord, chord organ, and uh, it's sort of uh, it sounds kind of like a harmonica. Those buttons, black and white buttons on the uh, side, if you pressed, would play uh, major and minor chords, and then you had about uh, yeah, a couple of octaves worth of. Uh, keys and when you played it it kind of sounded like a harmonica because basically that's the way it worked there was an electric motor in it that ran a pretty loud fan and when you pressed a key it would blow through a reed and you know make a sound so so, so you uh, were you were a, a kid just kind of learning how to 
have fun with this thing or, or did you, uh, yeah. was it simply uh, more of a hobby? Yeah. I mean, I, I was a kid at that point and, you know, they had, Magnus had a nice setup. They had music books, you know, you'll notice the, the keys are numbered with, I think mm -hmm. one to 22 on the white notes and uh, the black notes for whatever the adjacent white note was with a plus sign on it. Yeah, I can see that there. So one, one plus, whatever. And then the chords were just labeled. And so the sheet music was it... had the numbers over the notes. So you could just yeah. kind of oh, okay. follow the numbers. You know, it's like yeah. paint by numbers, only play by numbers. Was and, it polyphonic uh, other than the uh, the chord buttons on the left? Uh, yeah, it was polyphonic up to the point where if you pressed enough keys, there wouldn't be enough air okay. <laughs> being generated to, to blow wow. through it anymore. That's amazing. But if you were playing two or three notes, you could play chords on it. So you know, on YouTube, you'll find a couple of people still mm -hmm. messing with these. And uh, were the chord buttons just for somebody who didn't really know the chords yet? Uh, they were really designed. This really was a kid's organ, so it was designed oh, okay. just to make it easy. Yeah. So you'd play the lead part with the single notes, and that would keep it loud enough to be able to handle it all. And then the chords, you didn't have to worry about. You know, if it, if it was a C major, you press the white C button. If it was a C minor, you press the black C button. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, yeah, these came like in all a... different sizes. This one, this one, I think, is oh, okay. the exact same model I had. But you know, if mm -hmm. you a cheaper one, might only have three chords, and you were, were limited with what you could do with it. This one covered pretty much everything. So it was a good start. Yeah, I, I like really how lasted. it seems like a good learning instrument And the way they've got that really there. lasted me until uh, until I was getting into rock music and I ran into the band Iron Butterfly. Uh, this would have been 68 or 69 or somewhere mm -hmm. around there. So I was getting up to around the age of 13, 14, somewhere in that range. And uh, I loved the organ parts that were in Inagata De Vida. And I decided I had to learn how to play that. So that's technically the first song I tried to learn how to play on this thing. Oh, and okay. That was a bit of a stretch. So, uh, but it was at that stage that I decided, you know, we need to get a band together somehow and I got to get better stuff. So that's really the spark that said, okay, I, I, I want to play music, you know, maybe for a living. We'll see. Didn't really work out that way, but I'll get to that. So that was, that so, was rock music. You would just consider it back then rock, good old rock yep. and roll band. So uh, that led me to scrounging around, saving pennies, and getting one of these things, which is an Ace Tone Top 5, which is a legit 60s combo organ. had about uh, five or six different uh, sounds. It all sounded almost exactly the same. The gray button yeah. was vibrato, which uh, was kind of like the poor man's, poor man's Leslie. And, uh, but this was a legit combo organ, and this is the one I took into my very first band. Of course, this one didn't have any speakers either, so I had to invest in an amp. So we kind of raided the local music store and got whatever used junk we could find there, cheap. So, so was I ended that, up with one of these. Was that little organ portable? Did it have a top and, and you could close it up and carry it like a suitcase? Is that how it was meant yeah, to be done? Yeah, ex exactly. The legs un unscrewed and went into the cover, and then the cover went on the top, and you had a suitcase. It was okay. an awesome design as far as that goes. It and still looks sil silver pretty bar hefty, at the top though. Was a music stand. Not compared That's... to stuff I've got today. Well, yeah. <laughs> is that is yeah. what is that three three or four octaves there? Yeah. Yeah, but it wasn't that big, and you know, it was. And this definitely... this was this would have been quiet too, right? Other than when you're playing it. Yeah, because uh, yeah, uh, it, there's nothing in it, no speakers or anything else, so you had to have an amplifier. Yeah, and uh, other than that, didn't have a fan. <laughs> it was all you know, totally digital, I guess. So the amp I ended up with was a Sears Silvertone uh, two by twelve, and uh, th this was a great amp too. And I, these are going for thousands and thousands of dollars now. If I can find them, I should have hung on to it. I paid mm. about 200, 200 bucks for it back in the day. But uh, had two channels and had uh, built-in uh, spring reverb and tremolo. Oh wow! So uh, okay, it, it, it was awesome. So if you, the next picture I'm going to show you is the only existing photo of any band I was ever in in the 70s. And uh, I used to use the uh, speaker cabinet as a seat. And if we go to this one, that's my rig in the background there. So I would sit on the uh, speaker cabinet. The organ was sitting in front of me, and then I had the amp head sitting on top, so I had the controls right in front of me. Yeah, so that looks like I can see your organ right there in front of it. Yeah, the organ in this uh, by then had been painted black. The uh, 
the bottom used to be white like that. Okay. But, uh, in this version, it's all painted flat, flat black because uh, if you heard the story I told on Jamie's show, uh, our band basically wasn't very good. So uh, every time we'd play somewhere, you know, we'd survive and then we'd go out and we'd change the name of the band. And then yeah. we'd come back as a totally new group. <laughs> the only thing changed was the name, but they wouldn't know it was us. So we could kind of sneak back in and do it again. <laughs> so uh, we went That's through great. most of the seventies that way. But uh, at this point, the name of the band had changed. So I just painted everything over flat black, which made it easy. So <laughs> and, were, were uh, you playing primarily keys in the band? Yeah, that was it. Okay. I've I've never figured out how to sing and play at the same time. Do, so, do uh, you uh, do you remember any of those band names, or can you guess? Uh, I'm I'm trying to figure. I'm the, curious to see how cliche they might have been. The name that was painted on the back uh, was basically a song by Santana called "Shades of Time." And that's not uh, a bad bad band name at all. No, I read it off the album and said, hey, this one will do. Uh, yeah, I don't... It may have been a legal a issue there. Or something. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not, not sure. Uh, not for names. So Shades of Time was one of them. Uh, another country was uh, one of the ones that I've got a photo with that sign in front of the amp. So uh, mm -hmm. but other than that, that's about all I remember. This was that's a band great. I was playing in for about eight days, I think. We had about two practices and then went our separate ways. So. Oh, Yeah. This, this never happened, but uh, I got a picture out of it anyway. It's the only ones that survived. So, <laughs> Oh, that's great. That's great. And then uh, basically that was basically it. I, I, at that point, uh, so I can shut this off for a minute. So at that point, uh, you know, I was into high school, graduated high school, uh, had to figure out what my career would be. I didn't really feel like going to college, so... Uh, Somehow I found an aerospace company that uh, had an apprentice program and mm. I said, hmm, that sounds interesting. Somehow I managed to get accepted into that. So when I got out of high school at the age of 18, I uh, left my little hometown up in Massachusetts, moved to the big city of Lynn, uh, still in Massachusetts, and uh, started my career as an apprentice machinist. And basically everything musical, I, I hung on to the ace tone and brought it with me. So it was always set up and I, can, I always had something to tinker on. But essentially from then until about uh, oh, 2000 or so, uh, maybe even out later than that, uh, I've had a keyboard around to tinker with, but I was always busy with life. So uh, the, my music oh, okay. career kind of yeah. ended at that point or was put on, on hold for a few decades. So you, you, weren't, uh, you weren't recording anything or trying to record anything for a good while there? Very little. Uh, I've got a couple of videos that were done on VHS from 1985. I, I think I saw a partial uh, one of those on Jamie's show when you were on yeah, there, but, like a, a some sort of uh, sequenced arrangement. Yeah, uh, and uh, if you go to my Vimeo channel, you can see that, or, or my website. It's linked. It's linked to my website, but it's not on YouTube. But uh, so that's out there somewhere. But uh, uh, basically, I get married at a just before I turned 22 and spent the next several years having a couple of kids and bringing them up and ignoring pretty much everything else around me. Uh, that sounds like you were and a good dad then. The company I worked for, I stuck with until I retired in 2017. Uh, had a whole lot of different positions there, but none of, none of the music related. Uh, spent most of it actually being a buyer of aerospace parts. Uh, okay. And uh, finished up being a compliance auditor, you know, Trying to teach the uh, the new uh, generation of buyers how to do stuff because we did a lot of government contracts. So that was a big part of it. So, but definitely not musical. Yeah. But uh, yeah. But uh, let me go back here and uh, so uh, the next maybe the first real synth I got uh, would have been. Let's see, my kids were single digits. So this would have been late 1980s. Uh, this is a, a Con Electric Band. And uh, this was pretty cool. I This is the first time I went into debt to uh, get a, a rather interesting keyboard. And this mm -hmm. one uh, had a whole, whole lot of presets for different instruments. Uh, the thing that made it interesting, it, it had chord sections down here too. It also had built-in rhythm. So the black notes would trigger rhythm patterns and whatever. 
Oh, wow. And, and this is like the rhythm section over here, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. But it also had a bunch of controllers that you could kind of, uh, you know, it'd be the first attempt to have uh, controls that would alter the sounds, do different features to it. So I don't know if this is a, a true synth or not. I mean, by, you know, analog standards, definitely not. And in any idea, what was the, what was the architecture? Not a clue. Uh, yeah, had a big built-in speaker. Uh, did have speaker out, so you could. I had it plugged into my stereo to get it louder. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the volume pedal down there, and uh, that was pretty much it. Uh, it was a pretty good piece of furniture, and it it did have some interesting synth effects. Um, my favorite was one where it had kind of a portamento sweep that if you played a key and then let go, it would it would do a sweep up. Hmm. And I used to I used to use that at Halloween. We'd run kids through the apartment, and uh, I'd be dressed in <laughs> some gruesome costume, playing yeah. scary music, scary organ music. And then uh, when a big enough crowd had surrounded, and they all had their candy, and it was time to clear the room. I'd build it up into a big crescendo, hit that last note that would take off, and then I would stand up and suddenly be you know, with the costume about six foot four, and way more scary than when I was sitting there with my back turned to them. <laughs> and they would just clear out the room in seconds and uh then we'd let the next batch in <laughs> that's so awesome it was a lot of fun yeah no that that sounds great and then my first attempt at having two since at the same time i had that eventually i got one of these little yamaha pc 100s and i used to sit that right on top of the uh on top of the con because it had mm -hmm. plenty of room and this was another cool learning one because uh this one had uh sheet music on cards that had a mag stripe at the bottom oh wow so you'd run the card you run the card through this card reader on the top and then mm -hmm. you just sit it there then the synth would know the song and it had different modes so if if you wanted to play along with it uh it would wait till you hit the right note it would start playing the song and then you know as as long as you kept hitting the right notes it would keep advancing so okay you could learn the, learn the song that way yeah. or you could just let it go free for all and just that's awesome up or just play what you play what you wanted. So that that 1985 video that had me doing a little uh, blues thing. This is what I was actually playing. Okay. So the, arpe okay. the arpeggio and the drum beats in the background were coming from this, and uh, I was playing an organ lead on top of it. So that and looks like a, a digital synthesizer, uh, similar in size to say a micro Korg. I don't. That's yeah. a pretty popular yeah, those, small one these days. Yeah, those are mini keys, not full size, and. Uh, it was compact. It weighed about three pounds, and <laughs> again, yeah. it had the the suitcase format. You could mm -hmm. throw all the uh, throw all the music cards in there and take that with you and just go wherever you wanted to. So that was a fun little thing to have too. And basically, that's all I had until I got to Cincinnati. And when I got to Cincinnati, I started trying to explore a little more, and that's when I I hit on two brand names that uh i decided i liked uh one was yamaha's and i kind of adopted the yamaha psr series and i've had probably three or four different ones over the years but the psrs have always been like the rest of the band uh somewhere in between i had a casio that was the first uh keyboard i had that had a midi connection on it and i used to use my old atari 800 computer to you know come up with midi midi tracks and run them through the casio uh it's the first time I had the computer able to play something that sounded a lot more real than, uh, you know, the calliope kind of stuff the old Atari sounded like. So I, I'm, I'm curious. I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the uh, using the computer. So you had an Atari sequencer, you said? No, it was an Atari 800. Atari which was 800. The and it was that, that one of the uh, earliest computer, well, I guess maybe just sequencers that wasn't like a cv sequencer or something that tangerine yeah, dream might it? use no it wasn't even really a sequencer they had a few music oh, okay. programs because this is this predated the atari st oh, okay this came out the computer came out in 1980 late 1980 about the same time as the apple ii mm -hmm. and uh they were competitors so a lot of people went apple i went atari and uh i did a lot of stuff with it a lot more than people probably could figure out i ran a bulletin board system on it for about eight years and uh but there were music programs uh the one that came with it or what the early version was just called atari music composer and you put in a whole bunch of really archaic codes 
to generate each note. It'd be like a note for the 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 value of the note, the length of the note, you know, the octave, mm -hmm. whatever. And you just type yourself to death. And when you get done, you wow. could play a little tune that sounded. The, the Atari had four synths built into it, basically four sound generators. Okay. So you could play four part harmony, which is something pretty much nothing else at the time could do. But it was a real pain and a lot of in type, intensive typing to come up with simple stuff. Yeah. And then somebody came up, a guy named Lee Actor, I remember the name, came up with uh, the Advanced Music System, which was a big step up for, from what the Atari had published. And that was the first one that allowed you uh, uh, to compose a lot easier uh, and start using MIDI connections for the first okay. time. So, and, so uh, the Atari, so where did you get the hardware to interface between the computer and a, a keyboard then? Well, Atari had a, uh, had a general interface that everything had to go through, no matter what it was, the modem would plug into it, the printer would plug oh, okay. into it. Yeah. But, but somebody came up with a MIDI controller, it was a separate little box, had a mini in and out, and that was about it, that was designed to plug into the Atari computer. And that's really what made the link possible. But still, this is way before anything was standardized. So the Casio I had, you know, if you look at the current MIDI assignments that really haven't changed, you know, since about 1983, uh, you know, none of that existed then. So whatever I programmed to use on the Casio would just blow up anything newer when they finally standardized it. So mm -hmm. you know, it, was, it was definitely a singular journey still at that point. And then, uh, you know, originally it was just a tire generated and then the actor did a upgrade to his program and then allowed MIDI files to actually be saved as MIDI oh, files wow. for the first time. Yeah. And that's basically when I started collecting them and I had them on my bulletin board, you know, you could download them. So other Atari musicians could download the, you know, the collection, whatever we'd find. And, you know, this is really before the internet too. So our little network of independent bulletin boards is what how stuff got around back then. Yeah, so that would have been uh, like a, a dial-up bulletin board, and they would have to know, was there a certain phone number they'd have to dial yep. to access yep. your bulletin board? Yep, mine had a single number. It was a single line access, one at a time. Okay. I ran 24-7 yeah. for about eight years, and it probably wasn't idle for more than about 10 minutes a day in a 24-hour wow. period. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it was a little crazy. Everybody had auto dialers, you know, because you'd have, you know, whatever bulletin board you wanted to call, you knew it was going to be busy. So you just have the thing dialing okay. every 10 seconds till it connected. Yeah. And then it would sound an alarm to wake you up and, hey, I'm on. <laughs> wow. So. Yeah. No, so it sounds like you were really, really dedicated. I mean, you, you probably had a effectively a system set up. Did you have an extra phone line for that? Yeah, I did, actually, yeah. because uh, otherwise it would have been impossible. Um, couldn't make any phone calls yeah and uh, i can find your picture of that if you're interested but that's a really computer subject so we'll yeah maybe skip over that for today at any rate uh, when i got to cincinnati and uh, finally got my first pc in 1991 that's when they i retired the atari it was 11 years old wow uh i, I zeroed in on the yamaha psr series and also on the elisis qs series so uh this was one of my first ones, the uh, Analysis QS 6.1. It's a 60, uh, 61 key keyboard. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, a digital synth uh, had a large number of presets, really good pianos, really good organs, and a lot of crazy special effects too. So it wasn't bad. Um, was that sample were, based? Uh, I think so. And uh, when I got into them, they were a few years old too. So the, the, prices were reasonable and really yeah. um, I was still in the mode where I didn't have any money. So, uh, so what I did to build these, I found out the 6.1, they started out with like a QS six and that had a, a single card slot. And then they did an upgrade to it, rebranded it the 6.1. And one of the upgrades is that now I had two card slots. So they had these big SD cards that you could buy and they were like a hundred bucks a piece. Wow. And, uh, you know, you could put two in the back and that gave you two extra banks of sound. So it was like, uh, I think four different banks built in plus the user bank of stuff you could save yourself. And if you oh, had the okay. cards plugged in, that gave you two additional. And every one of those had 128 
different things on it. So, you know, so, between them so all, you had, you had a pretty big collection. Were you starting to learn? I mean, did you craft your own patches on this synthesizer and save them into that user bank? Uh, I could have, but I was really content just collecting everybody else's stuff, you know, okay. what I could find. Yeah. Because trust me, if you got a thousand presets, you never find them all <laughs> yeah. anyway. So, yeah. So you got, eventually you got to stop and play something. So I had well, plenty that, to mess that with. That interface doesn't look like it's made for sound designing. It looks more like it's made for yeah. cruising yeah, through just, presets. Yep, pretty much. So I found out, I, I ended up starting actually, I was practically a dealer for these things because I found out that there were a million of these on eBay. They're all pretty cheap. Hmm. And regardless if they came stripped to the bone or if they had 10 different memory cards with them, uh, they were all selling for the same price. So I'd target the ones that had a lot of accessories, buy those, keep what I didn't have, sell off the surplus, sell the extra keyboard off for what I paid for it, and wow. move on to the next one. I, I probably moved through about 10 of these in a two-year period. Wow. So, so eventually, uh, I went up to the 7.1, which is the 71 key keyboard, uh, basically for free. And eventually settled in at the 8.1, which was the uh, full-size uh, weighted uh, 88 key version. Let's see. Did, did they make a pretty good piece of hardware? Yeah, they're decent. Uh, these are all from the 90s. And uh, my 8.1, I don't have it in this room because it doesn't fit. Because my big A-frame stand won't, won't fit in yeah, here. Yeah, it no. looks massive. That's, that's the next part of the story. But yeah, this one's pretty hefty and heavy. Uh, it's fully weighted. 88 keys, so it probably comes in at about 80 pounds. And, how how uh, does the, uh, with it being a, you said a full, fully weighted keys, do you find that's a, causes any issue if you're trying to play quicker, like synth style parts, or your are your fingers pretty well muscled yeah, so you can uh, just bang away on it? No, this one will wear you down, but uh, I use this one primarily for pianos, but it, I, yeah. the other thing this, this, the Elise has had, a, you know, I'm, I'm a Deep Purple fan as well, and there's a Purple B preset in here that sounds just like Deep Purple's organ, where they, where they used to run it through a Marshall amp to uh, with distortion, which is how they get that raunchy sound they used. And this has has it down to a T. So if you oh, find any of my Deep Purple covers, I'm probably playing this one to do uh -huh. most of the organ part. But uh, so the QS8 and the PSRs kind of became. Uh, my go-to keyboards and then the uh around 2004 i got this one which i also still have this is a uh, psr 2100 and this this is basically the band uh you can play you know, i run the if i'm if i'm doing playing myself and i want to be complete i'll have this playing a midi track that plays everything except the lead part Okay. And then I'll play the lead part over it. Or now that I have a room full of synths, you know, I can move around. Still, this will be the the band basically doing all the background stuff. And then I can move around to all the other keyboards and, uh, you know, play with it. But uh, this one is getting older. And I don't know if you could see it on here or not. But the input on this is through a three and a half inch floppy drive, which is <laughs> on the front there. And I'm running out of discs and I don't trust them much more. So I figured yeah. before this one burns out and I lose everything, I should go for something a little better. So I did buy a uh, a newer version of this about two years ago. It's a, a PSR S975, which uh, basically is the same thing, only upgraded. It uh, it'll run on uh, flash drives and has twenty okay. times as much memory and uh, a whole lot more drum drum beats and features. So uh, so this is essentially, uh, I think they would call it a what is that a workstation. Like yeah, it, pretty you much. Can, you can do everything. How many simultaneous sequences can you run off of that? Uh, basically, it'll play a MIDI file. So whatever's on the MIDI file, you know, up to 16 tracks. Oh, wow. MIDI tracks simultaneously. Uh, po polyphonic? Polyphonic. 16 polyphonic? Yep. Wow, okay. So I, it, I mean, uh, so, so do you make the MIDI files elsewhere and then load them into this, or do you make them on here? I've still got the collection that I started in 1980. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. So uh, most of those, some are better than others, but you know. This looks I, intimidating, looking but maybe new, once you learn it, you can, you know, lickety split, come up with some yeah, sequences and loop yeah, them and arrange them and all that. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. And the newer mm -hmm. ones are easier. So then uh, basically uh, 
I got my first uh, real synth back in 2008. That's when I got my uh, Voyager. And uh, this is a nice Voyager too, because this has a little history to it too. I kind of fell into this one by accident. It was on eBay and uh, it's an anniversary edition and it's got the 50th anniversary edition badge on it. But if you're familiar with Moog Voyager history, the anniversary editions, almost all of them are painted black. And mm. this one isn't, it's all natural wood. So I asked them about that and uh, they told me that, yeah, they made a few like this one. And uh, the sales rep from Moog told me they had made exactly five of them for US distribution that looked like this. Even the gold and, knob? Uh, the gold knob was, uh, came a little later. Oh, okay. And that, 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 that was mailed out by Moog to every Voyager owner on record uh, when they had uh, whatever the next anniversary was. So mm -hmm. everybody got a gold, a gold uh, filter uh, knob to, uh, you know, to accent it. I still got the original black one somewhere in case it makes a difference someday. I'll hang on to the gold one no matter what. But. Yeah. So anyway, they gave me a cert basically that was uh, notarized that said this is one of uh, five anniversary editions that was made in natural wood sold in the U.S. So uh, hopefully that makes it worth 20 times as much as what I paid for it. And uh, Yeah, I my bet. Es my estate will get it because I'm not selling anything. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I'm unfamiliar with this synthesizer. What's the little knob on the on the bottom right of the keyboard there? Or, uh, okay, that, uh, that yeah, right is there. actually the control for the uh, for the backlighting. Oh. So if it's cranked up, all you can dim it if it's too bright, mm -hmm. basically. So not all Voyagers have backlit panels, but the ones that do yeah, okay. have that knob to uh, adjust the brightness. This Does one lights that up blue. ever create noise if it's up real loud? Uh, I guess it depends on how they implement it. Yeah, uh, it's never made any noise at all. Okay, because I've unless heard. You turn up the noise. <laughs> yeah. I, I've heard with some of the Roland keyboards specifically uh, that that there can be some bleed through from backlighting. Um, did it come with the clear pitch and mod wheels as well? Are those? Uh... Yeah, they're. Uh, let's see, where am I here? They're. Uh, yeah, they're clear and they light up blue. Okay. So, yeah, that, uh, that's a that's a really top of the line piece of equipment there. Yep. So that's the first true analog synth I ever had, and that was my. Basically, when I crossed the threshold uh, from the point of no return, <laughs> so but I got that in two thousand eight, and 2008, basically okay. that 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 was my total rig. I had the twenty one hundred yeah. in the middle, the eight point one underneath, and the Voyager up top. Okay, that's yeah, what I, I ran with the from. Uh, backlighting looks great on that. Yeah, so that's what I ran with from twenty from two thousand eight to about twenty seventeen. And that's when everything changed. That's when I retired from uh, my corporate life. Uh, they gave me an early retirement package, so I actually uh, left with a little extra money to go with it. And we went on a seven-week vacation around the world, <laughs> actually around the Midwest or the West. We went as, as far out as El Paso, Texas and back in a giant circle. It took seven weeks. Wow. And uh, the very last stop, which was probably the most expensive one in retrospect, is uh, we'd gone to Asheville, North Carolina and uh, dropped in at the Biltmore for Christmas. And on the very last day before we came home, we did about a two hour visit to the Moog factory. And that's when everything changed. <laughs> I, I, I can imagine, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I'd be very hesitant to go to the Moog, Moog factory myself. So uh, at I, that I point, just I like came, you. Uh, yeah, I uh, had the opportunity to play one of Keith Emerson's modulars that they had on display there. They were getting ready to roll out uh, their new uh, new release of it. I guess they made probably three or four more, custom mm -hmm. ordered for about 150 grand a piece if you want one. So was that but, a, a uh, 5U? I can't remember what the series numbers are, but they've got like a smaller one and then they've got a bigger one. Yeah, this was probably a couple of those stacked high. Yeah, wow. His setup... His setup, uh, when stacked at keyboard level, would take it up about seven and a half feet high. <laughs> so it towered over you, if you uh, uh, remember seeing him on stage. A hundred grand for that sounds like a steal. Yeah, but uh, it was basically identical to what he used on stage. Mm -hmm. And they you know, re reproduced, you know, however many uh, people wanted to buy them, they got them. But uh, I think they had one of, I don't think it was his personal one. I think it was one that belonged if I remember the story right, they told me it belonged to his uh, setup guy 
and it was like the backup unit if anything happened to his the second one was always with them too and they looked identical so they could swap them out if they had mm -hmm. to and that's when i got to play at the factory and then we did the whole tour and i came home with the mother 32 which was pretty new back then yeah and uh which is uh in your little three-tier case on the kind of the lower right yep. there Yep, and they just kept releasing new stuff, and I just hadn't run out of money yet. So uh, between <laughs> 2017 and 2020, I went from having the original three-piece rig, which is still yeah. there in the middle, yeah. to having all this other stuff to go with it. So uh, I grabbed the Mother 32. I grabbed a DFAM to go with it. Okay. Uh, eventually, I got a subharmonicon to round out the uh, the uh, three-tier trio. The, the trifecta. Yep. And then uh, somewhere in between, I got the grandmother, and then I picked up a Moog One to go with it. And uh, last but not least, the Matriarch. Is is the Moog One? Do you have a, an eight or a sixteen voice? Sixteen. Okay. Now, uh, did you pick the Moog One up early on, or did you like? Did you have to go through some of the the firmware growing pains with yours? Yeah. Uh, I got one of the first ones shipped. It was uh, okay. serial number 80, 87. Oh, wow. Okay. But it was one of the first hundred that was shipped to Sweetwater. Yeah. So uh, I got that in October of uh, 2018, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it came with uh, version 1.0.0 on it. And uh, we're up to, I think, 1.4. And, well, and uh, I, I wonder, because but, but I... I... To, trying to remember if some of, the, some of the firmware issues had to do with interfacing with a computer... And if you're just using it in this context, maybe you avoided some of those issues. Yeah, the the longest running thing is getting MIDI to work right, because a lot of it wasn't implemented. I mean, it could play mm -hmm. notes, but MIDI is a lot more complicated than it used to be when I started, from what I remember yeah. of it, because now you've got all these change controls that do yeah. pretty much anything. Yeah. And th those were never implemented in the initial release. I really just wanted to get oh. this out so people could start playing it. Yeah. And because uh, they knew they'd catch up, you know, and, they're still adding stuff all the time, you know, and this one has been really well behaved. You know, you see a lot of videos where people, a lot of people had major tuning issues, particularly mm -hmm. in the lower octaves. That yep. was just fixed in the most recent update uh, where they finally nailed that down and put it to bed with an automatic uh, compensation protocol that runs in the background. But uh, mine never really had any trouble. You know, I, mine's always been playable and I've never had to do anything to it that, you know, have uh, you thought about that, that uh, swapping up. out for a, a black grandmother or matriarch, or are you pretty happy with the color scheme you've got there? Yeah, you need a little color in there. Uh, if everything was black and white, you wouldn't be able to tell them apart. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I'm in my real studio, you know, it's all usually dimly lit. And yeah, just I trying to that. find anything is hard enough. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, any, any hints they give me by having different panels, different colors, uh, I'll take it. So now, what's the uh, one above the the Moog One? Uh, that's the newest Yamaha. So I've still got okay in, in the full studio. I'm running both of them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's the old one, the uh, 2100, and that's the S975 that will replace this someday if it ever dies. But uh, in the meantime, I run them both because I've still got room. So uh, when you run them both, would you, maybe one be the main sequencer and the other one might do drums or something? Like, do you have specific roles you like to use them as? Well, they both have 16 channels and you know, none of my MIDI files go higher than that. So I can do, I can play any MIDI file on either one of them and it'll come out pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're interchangeable, basically. It's just whichever one's the quickest one to set up. Yeah. Uh, some of the sounds have changed slightly. Uh, there's actually a few on the old one uh, that I like better than the new one. You know, one in particular is this uh, saxophone setting that, if you hit it the after, if you hit it hard, the aftertouch uh, makes it growl. And I oh, think wow. the old one sounds better than the new one. You know, yeah. so the, uh, the those those digital chips sound better when they get older. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't I don't know what the deal was with that, but yeah, uh, maybe yeah. I mean, it could have been a lower fidelity somewhere in the signal chain. Yep, but uh, so the new one has more features and more drum sounds and mm -hmm. you know a lot more memory so and a lot more capability. But yeah. I'm still hanging on to this till it dies because it's got some stuff I still use. So yeah, yeah. You know, somebody had a survey recently wanted to know you know 
what it takes to sell a synth. And I basically told him, I don't know what that means. You know, everything I've bought, I like, I bought it because I like it, you know, unless I'm replacing it with the next version, you know, yeah. it's just swapping it out. I don't have a reason to sell anything. I mean, if I didn't like it, I wouldn't have bought it. <laughs> you know, I'm still playing most of these before, before I get them. So we're with the Moog stuff, it's kind of a leap of faith, but uh, there's plenty of videos now to kind of get a feel for it. Yeah. Well, and with, with, uh, with a company like Moog, it's it's hard hard to hard to go wrong. Yep. You know, they just but, uh, impeccable. So anyway, that's the way the studio looked right up until around October and uh, uh, October of twenty twenty. Yes, and then yeah, okay. twenty twenty happened again. We had to uh, run down to Texas again uh, for about a month. Uh, my dad was having some health problems. We decided to. Uh, go get him uh, quarantined and safe to move and brought him back here for treatment. So he's living with us now. Okay. And uh, during that month we were gone, uh, apparently my sump pump failed somewhere, maybe two weeks into it. And uh, here in the Midwest with all that nice Midwestern clay, if you don't have a sump pump, eventually you will flood your basement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we came home and opened the door and said, Hey, we're home. And I opened the cellar door and there's like a half an inch of water everywhere. So, oh, wow. uh, everything in this room, you know, this was up on a carpet and everything's on stands anyway. So there's really no damage to any equipment in here, but it kind of wiped out the walls. And, yeah. So, so yeah. the electrical system wasn't exposed to the water then it sounds like. Yeah. Not here anyway. Cause the, yeah. the, the carpet in this room kind of saved everything. The, the room next to this is my regular office mm. and that had more of a hardwood, uh, a fake mm -hmm. hardwood floor. But that allowed the water to actually be an inch deep in places. And uh, some of the power strips there did get submerged. And one of them fried itself, like melted down. Wow. <laughs> so I'm kind of glad the house was still yeah. there after seeing that one. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. But, uh, you're, you're lucky the house was still there when you drove up. But uh, but that was the only, only one. So as of uh, this morning, actually, they finally started a reconstruction of the place. But uh, they... Uh, this is what it looked like this morning before they started uh, reconstruction. This is after everything was ripped out. So it's looked similar to this since the, uh, since about Thanksgiving or thereabouts or you know, mid December. Mm -hmm. And I've been waiting for our turn to, you know, they, they cleaned it up got all the mold out and all that other good stuff. But uh, I've been waiting since then for our turn to actually get them back in here to put it back together again. So that actually started today, this wall over here that just has this foam stuff is now actually, uh, got new uh, drywall on it so that was today's progress and hopefully the rest of this in the next month will get finished up again and uh, get back down there and out of my living room so As, were they uh, able to uh, fi figure out exactly what went wrong and take take steps so you don't have to worry about it again hopefully well I actually got it running again within a couple hours after being home and the problem was is that the the motor was fine but the switch that turns it on you know there's a float that floats up and it's supposed to throw a switch mm -hmm. and the switch got stuck so the float went up and nothing mm -hmm. happened yeah <laughs> so uh i beat it with a plastic coat hanger trying not to get electrocuted and uh, <laughs> got the switch to kick in and it did its job and emptied all the, the water out in about 12 seconds <laughs> yeah but, so but, so it wasn't everything that you had, had a of, well i i guess so so in the region you're in the the basements aren't made to be watertight they just are mostly watertight and then they have a sump that keeps them from flooding is that how you how it's normally yeah, the, done in uh, that region yeah the sump keeps the water down you know the yeah, sump goes okay. down about two feet below the floor level and you can see the water table in the sump you know and if it starts going up it'll it'll pump it out before it goes anywhere else but uh, yeah when that stops it basically went up just about level with the top uh, of the sump pump thing which is basically a half an inch above floor level <laughs> and, yeah uh, the, yeah that's as high as it got. I mean, it could, probably could have got worse, but uh, we got home before it, you know, went totally crazy. So, uh, yeah, so that's basically it. And the room I'm sitting in now, uh, I wanted to try to keep running as best as I could. So my office mm -hmm. ended up in the spare bedroom and uh, the music room ended up in what used to be my living room. So this is where I'm actually sitting now. And uh, it's full <laughs> yeah i, I didn't, can see that I, w I wasn't able to put the a-frame in because it w nothing would fit but uh i got everything but the uh but uh, one of the yamahas the older yamaha and the qs 8.1 are still tucked away 
and but everything else is in here and i'm still able to record i've made a couple of videos so it's keeping me off the street still but my wife will be very happy to get this room back and the spare bedroom particularly is that with a, my dad living is that a there. theremin on the right yeah. okay yes there is actually right now the theremin is holding my computer up to get okay. the uh the view that you've got but yeah uh, yeah i've picked up the theremin somewhere in between uh I don't actually use it too much. If I had known more about it, I probably would have got the the newer Theramini version that has the CV outputs because then I could interface it oh, with other stuff. Yeah. But this one, this one's good for Halloween, and uh, I've done a couple mm -hmm. couple videos with it. But uh, mostly, it's to uh, keep the grandchildren amused, yeah. keep them away from the, keep them away from the expensive stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I've also noticed, uh, how, how long have you had the, uh, the drum brute? Uh, the drum brute came out, uh, let's see. Is that the, that's two or three years old, I think. Yeah. I've had it maybe a year, maybe a little over okay. a year. I had the, I had the, uh, mother 32 and the D fam and, uh, the DFAM by itself is somewhat limited. You know, it does a yeah, lot of cool I, stuff. I, I but hear if you're that trying a lot. Get... You might need two of them to have a full percussion set. Right. So you can get like toms or, or kick drums and maybe a hi-hat all in one shot. And mm -hmm. Actually, maybe get it doing some sequence, some synthesizer sequence notes in there as well if you wanted to. But uh, that's about it with, a, with one of them. So I uh, grabbed the... Uh, the drum brute just to give me a little extra to uh, play around with creating my own stuff. Uh, what I use a lot because the Yamaha's keyboards have such uh, expansive percussion sections that include background accompaniment. Hmm. I use those in most of my videos actually, but occasionally I'll mix them all together. So uh, sometimes they're, uh, hooked up with the CV clock to keep them in sync. Sometimes, uh, sometimes they're not <laughs> Run, running fast and loose. Yeah. The, uh, like the Moog one has a digital, uh, display and the Yamaha's have a digital display that can tell you exactly how many beats per minute you're doing. Mm -hmm. So if I get the drum brute and the Yamaha's and the Moog one, all set at the same thing. They'll stay in sync long enough for most three or four minute songs without getting too far, oh, okay. too crazy. So I can just let them run wild. Or if I am using the DFAM or the Mother 32, those are a little more wild. There's no way to really tell exactly what they're doing. Yeah. So I'd have to use a clock out from something. I usually do that with the uh, the clock outs from either the grandmother or the matriarch. Oh, okay. Or all of, or all of them. I can chain all four of them together mm -hmm. along with the drum brute, which I've done. And, so... Uh, so just to clarify, you're the only, how do you record the sound? As far as I know, you have no sequencer as far as a computer. There's no DAW involved at all. Yep. Uh, somehow it ends up on YouTube. Yeah, I've been DAWless pretty much forever. Now I finally, I used to have a Dell uh, PC that I did the recording on. And basically everything in the room feeds into a, to a, that brand B that nobody likes to mention. Oh. I have one of their I have one of their mixers. Okay, yeah, that was the, 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 the mixer by the roll in there, yeah. Yeah. So that's got an onboard and, uh, is it just two track digital recorder? Yeah. It's not even a digital recorder. I record on the computers. But everything in the room feeds in through the mixer. Okay. So so any mixing I want to do as far as balancing and volume and whatever, I I need to kind of make sure I do a trial run and get that set yeah. up yeah. front. So I get all the levels set mm -hmm. and it all runs through the mixer and out the two channels and into the computer. And okay. it's recorded in two track stereo all in one shot. And that's why most of my videos are kind of live improvisations. And, uh, but now I've kind of upgraded computers to a MacBook pro. So I'm running logic now for the first time, still trying to figure that out. Oh yeah. Uh, for now, my videos are still two track, but, uh, I'm starting to incorporate, uh, some after effect kind of stuff. So I'm starting, mm. like I've been playing around with Valhalla, super massive. I threw that oh. into the, the last video I did, uh, Spring Forward, mm -hmm. uh, had Valhalla applied after after the performance part of it. So okay. I'm starting to cheat a little bit, I guess, from my traditional workflow. But uh, 
I guess I like to consider I'm still expanding my horizons here because yeah. really I've kind of flown by the seat of my pants since day one. You know, I've never had lessons. I just kind of do stuff until it works and maybe it's wrong, but it works. So, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, I like that approach myself. Just follow your passion. You're like, Ooh, what's this? Ooh, that sounds interesting. Let's play with that. And you just, you know, you get comfortable and then you feel like, Oh, maybe I'll add something else in here. And, Eventually, you you arrive at this nice equilibrium where everything has a role, and you know you just be be your artist, and you don't have to think about too much while you're doing it. So um, I I wanted to ask, at what point did you start to learn synthesis? Because this and and there's no presets on on some of that gear in there. So at some point, you had to figure out what all the knobs did and how to translate the sound you hear in your head to pressing the keys and hearing that sound yeah that probably started when i got the voyager because it's like i said it's the first true analog now the voyager mm -hmm. does have presets as well so yeah. uh it was a nice introduction because i could start with the preset and then start turning knobs and figure out how it all works yeah and, that, and that's nice, got a really good full and, panel too yeah and the nice thing with the voyager you probably can't see it at all but if you touch any knob on this thing mm -hmm. once it's on a preset the display changes and it says, okay, for, I just turned the filter. So whatever preset I've got, it's saying that the, the preset memory, it was set to 140. It's mm -hmm. a number from zero to 127. And uh, whatever you turn it to, you'll see the new value. So it'll tell yeah. you what it was and it'll tell you what you changed it to. So if you want to go back, it's sitting right there. And that works for every knob on the thing. So if you just want to see what they did to get a preset, it might take you a couple of minutes, but you can go to a preset and then just tweak every knob until you set the knob to the position that it was set to internally. Mm -hmm. Just make the numbers the same. And then you can look at the display and you'll see exactly how it was set up when they made the preset. Yeah. Yeah. That's, so those, that's, those are my favorite a, kind of synthesizers is when it has exactly what you described. Yeah. Then that's you a can, powerful learning tool and it makes it pretty yeah. easy. Yeah. If, if you're intrigued and you like the way it sounds and you're dedicated you can learn a whole lot just using that method you described. So, yeah, that's that's great. So I played with that for really uh, about nine years before I got the next step up. You know, when I started getting the semi-modular stuff with the uh, Mother 32 and the D family, that's a whole different thing there's no presets there yeah although they did give you little cards you know little okay. overlays uh like like this this is this one happens to go to the subharmonicon mm -hmm. but uh the dfam has them too and the mother 32 has them and if you uh, get up and up and close this sits over the over the knobs basically yeah. and then it's got a little orange line that tells you if you want this preset this one's called uh, shifting intervals if you set all the knobs to where the little orange line is, and then if it's a button, uh, the outline of the button is lit up. So you, that says that button should be pushed down. And it's got the position of all the switches. And then if it needs patch cables, it's, it's got the lines drawn that show you, okay, run a cable from there to there, there to there, and whatever. So by the time you're done, you've got a preset. And I, oh. I'm guessing, do they have a method like a little app or something where you can make your own versions of those cards? Do they have something uh, like that? The the manual and the, you can download a PDF that'll have a blank one. Okay. And you can yeah. print as many as you like, but uh, they won't have the holes in it. And uh, yeah. basically, you you can mark down so you can remember. Yeah. But uh, you know, if the temperature changes ten degrees, uh, it might not be exactly the same. And some of those little knobs are pretty fine. So, uh, yeah, you know, you can get it close to what you had before, but there's never a guarantee you'll ever hear what you liked again. <laughs> but that's true with any any true analog sense. So, uh, I, I I found you do I, your best. <laughs> usually, I actually I actually like that a little bit because like it sounds a little different, <clears throat> but that doesn't sound bad. It just sounds a little different. And, you know, you can just get that extra variation in there and. You just got to change the way you're you're thinking. You know, if, if you're used to every, if you come from the DAW world and start using analog, you kind of go bonkers for a little while because you're used to I just shut it, turn it off, sounds exactly the same as it did yesterday, and I can just go. But 
uh, a lot of times with analog, especially your uh, semi-modulars, it's, it's not quite that easy. It can be close, but you might have something that's got to move, you know, an eighth of an inch or so to get back to where you thought it was. <laughs> yeah, but that is what makes it fun. So, uh, you know, that's where the experience comes in is trying to figure out what you did. But, uh, you know, if you really like what you did, record it quick. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've learned that too. I was like, okay, I don't know what I'm doing next, but I better record that because that sounds amazing. So, yeah, that's that's great. If you're one of the guys that tunes it in and says, hey, this is great, I'll use this in a song next week. Well, maybe you will, maybe you won't. Yeah. <laughs> you you got to have an extra one and set that one to the side or take a Polaroid or, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I even sometimes just shutting it off and turning it on, it doesn't quite come out the same. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're a lot more stable than they used to be, but they're still analog. So, <laughs> so uh, what do you, what have you got coming up next? I assume this is all. You're going to be moving back downstairs, and uh, are you thinking about making any arrangement changes to the way it was before? Or are you going to just put it all right back the way it was? It'll be similar to the way it was, but uh, I am adding a couple new things. Uh, it was all kind of haphazard before because it was built up over time. And, okay. Uh, and portions of that were still being used for storage. You, know, you look at some of my videos and look in the background, you might see all kinds of junk. You never know what you find back there. But uh, one thing, one improvement we're making since we're kind of rebuilding the place is uh, that little section where the sump pump was used to just have a little wall, like two sides. But it was just, uh, you know, like three feet wide, three feet square maybe, that had an opening to go in where the sump pump was. So you couldn't see the sump pump, but it was back there. So the room itself was kind of L-shaped because of that. Hmm. But everything in the, in the L back by the sump pump was all just full of junk and boxes and, you know, whatever my wife collected. Yeah. So uh, you know, that was all junk anyway. So we're extending that wall all the way across now and going to put a door at the other end. So mm-hmm. that, that will make the room a little smaller, but really the functional area is going to be the same and it'll be a rectangle. And if the backside is full of junk, you won't see it anymore. So that's going to be the first improvement. Yeah. And yeah. beyond that, uh, I did buy an extra desk that I plan on putting the MacBook on. Hmm. And I, do, and I do have a, uh, a key step 37 that I picked up to interface with okay. the computer and just act as a spare mini controller. Typically, I'm using one of the one of the real synths to to do any MIDI input, like if I want to do MIDI into the Mother 32 or something. But so now I've got a key step that I can use with that, and that's never been set up anywhere yet. So hopefully, that table I can get the computer and the key step. And I haven't decided if I want to put the mixer in that or not, because that'll be the fourth side basically. So there's going to have to be a little room to get by. But I, <laughs> yeah, I, I still need to be able to reach everything. That's the problem I have here. Is you know, in the in the rack downstairs, I had the Voyager on the tripod, you know, on the top, and I had the mixer right next to it. So it was since I do all the mixing pretty much live, I mm-hmm. need to be able to reach the volume controls if something goes muck, particularly like with the Moog One, where every preset might be forty decibels difference oh, in the volume geez. that it comes out. You know, some are really quiet, some kick in sixteen voice unison and it can blow you right out of your chair. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And you never know till you hit the button. So if you're doing stuff on the fly, you might want to have that close enough to make some quick adjustments. Yeah. 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 Stay in reach. But like right now, the mix is way over there and I can't reach it. And the modular stuff is close enough to lean into and get to, but I can't read yeah. anything. <laughs> if I'm trying to figure out what the patch cords are doing, I'd like to get that close enough that I can actually see it. Because uh, like I said, my eyes aren't getting any better as I sure here so uh so you think you got a, a few try weeks to fix. think you got a few weeks before you'll be moving moving this back downstairs yeah i probably got a good month i think oh, the okay. uh the construction crew's got probably two or three weeks to get everything back in there and then uh then the last step will be to get the flooring guy back in so the carpet and flooring is on order i'm not sure when that's going to be coming in yet but all that has to get in there and then once that's all done then i can start moving stuff but I got a ton of stuff to move. I got everything up here. Uh, I've got a room full of stuff in yeah. the uh, family room. I've got my offices all upstairs and all the other junk that wouldn't fit anywhere else is in a 
12 foot trailer that's blocking half my driveway for three months oh man so uh, it'll be like moving again yeah it sounds <laughs> like it so hopefully we can get rid of some junk and uh yeah hopefully it'll be a much more uh smooth and ergonomic ergonomic workflow by the time i'm done so yeah that's the goal yeah that's uh that's gonna be nice nice change for you um so so in, line, in, I don't really know what it's going to look like. We got to get it down there and see how it fits, and then start yeah, moving stuff around. Yeah. So in the meantime, we'll are you just going to keep uh, doing what you're doing up here? And are you are you working on anything specific, or do you just kind of turn it on and go a couple days a week? Yeah, I do it in spurts. Uh, you know, it's it's harder to hide here because this really is, you know, in the mainstream flow of the house. So yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, if, if anybody's running around, it's an open doorway to the to the real world. So uh, I can't really barricade myself in like I'm used to, and I can't really turn up the Rollins and the PVs that are under them <laughs> and shake the. Uh, you know, there's too much breakable stuff in the corners here. That, yeah, that... I can see that. <laughs> so, uh, so I have to behave and keep it pretty much on headphones, or you know, at least limit the volume so I don't chase everybody out of the house because we got no place to go right now anyway. Yeah, yeah. Getting closer, but not there yet. So, uh, so yeah, uh, I've done two projects recently. Uh, these have been kind of seasonal. I came out with a thing uh, right after our last snowstorm. Uh, we got two or three inches of snow, and there are icicles everywhere, and I thought it looked kind of cool. So mm -hmm. I did a little thing called Winter Solace, and uh, that got posted, I don't know, about a month ago or so. And uh, that one, I just shot video out my windows, you know, close-ups of the squirrels running around back and icicles and out the front window and, you know, the front windows behind me and uh, kind of pieced it all together and then just played something that sounded like it would fit and, you know, published that and off that one went. So uh, the next step, when it started warming up two days later, yeah, uh, I decided it was time to, uh, and I knew the time change is coming up this weekend too. So uh, I decided to, this is the first one that was pre-planned like this, where I had no idea what the song was going to be yet. But I figured the title's going to be Spring Forward. Uh, for the first time, I went out on, I think it's Pix Pixabay or Pixabay.com or whatever. Mm -hmm. This is a website that has free uh, video segments you can download. Yeah. I pulled down half a dozen videos about spring that included some birds and with the uh, birds chirping and you know different things and some of that i kept in there some of them didn't have a soundtrack okay i was wondering when i watched that video if you had made the bird sounds on your synthesizers or if they were part of a rec pre-recorded bird sounds yeah yeah the bird sounds were pre-recorded on the video that i that i borrowed and uh yeah. so uh it, but it all fit together beautifully so i i was pretty impressed so I literally put down about four minutes, four, four to five minutes worth of video and said, okay, this is sort of the workflow, how it's going to go. Now I need to play something for four and a half minutes that fits. So I, uh, and I wanted to get the sub harmonicon in there for the, cause I don't use that too much in productions. Cause it's, that's kind of complicated, you know, with the multi it looks intimidating. patterns. Yeah. So uh, that, that's still one I haven't tamed, but I can get it to behave a little bit sometimes. So I came up with the, some basically metal, mellow sounding slow chord changes for that and got it to sync up with the DFAM and uh, did a little extra uh, with the uh, with the drum brute, but it's turned down really slow with them. You know, because it's being controlled by, uh, actually the clock rate on the grandmother was the master control in that. Mm. Uh, I have no idea what it, the true beats per minute was, but it's probably around 40-ish. I think I've got something in uh, in Logic. I could probably play that back, and it'll tell me. But I haven't yeah. done that yet. But it's uh, kind of slow. You know, the the drum brute was dragging. It was taking, you know, to, to run the full sixteen note cycle was taking about a minute or so. It seemed like. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, yeah. It, but it was designed to be mellow. So the tones mm -hmm. I used, and I was using the the grandmother and the Voyager for lead with very similar sounds. But kind of uh, uh, just musical, you know, the, the, no sharp edges. They weren't. They were more like sine waves. The probably a sine wave on the Voyager and mm. uh, some kind of triangle on the on, on the grandmother. But they were all filtered down, so there weren't any sharp edges. You know, it was all nice and musical. Yeah. 
you know, yeah. when you throw the reverb in on top of it, you know, it really just kind of set the stage for a real nice in-depth, you know, thing. You have to play it back someday and see what I'm talking about. But I was kind of impressed with just the the mood that it set. It was exactly what I was looking for. So uh, well, that's great. And beyond that, it wasn't much. You know, it's uh, it's probably a C minor chord being played pretty much through the whole thing. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it's just running like that. And uh, I cut it at about the right length and then just trimmed the video to fit. And uh, that was it. So that took, uh, it took me one day to go search out, the, research the videos. Mm -hmm. And then once I had it all together, it took me about an hour to get the, I, I laid down the subharmonicon, DFAM, and drum brute parts first and said, okay, this is going to be the backing for it. Then I just sat down and played something. And then that took till around 2 p.m. And then I spent the rest of the day editing the video and it was up that night. <laughs> so it was basically one 24 hour period. That, yeah. And, and that's the way I work most of the time. You know, I'll okay. get an idea in my head and I'll be thinking about it for a week or two or three. Yep. And then, then I'll start just noodling around trying to see if I can get anything that'll stick. And, uh, at some point I say, okay, this is probably close enough. I better go do this before I forget it all. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm at the age now where just because I remembered it yesterday doesn't mean it'll be there tomorrow. So if I've got an idea, I better run with it. So that's when I just run around, set up my cameras, get the computer in here, plug it all in and run. And uh, typically it's one or two takes max. And uh, mm. then I work with what I got and, you know, half the times in post editing, just making everything fit together. But uh, that's all video. I'm usually running three cameras. Oh, know, okay. one's, one's my iPhone, one's my iPad. And the third one's I've got a, uh, a uh, Nikon uh, digital camera that takes movies too. And that'll be the third one. So I'll put them in three different angles to cover whatever I'm playing that day. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, they all record the sound. So I have that to sync up with Oh, okay. the, the only the only audio I actually use at the end is the two track that's coming out of the mixer yeah. directly into the computer, but I'll use the the room audio basically from the three cameras to synchronize it. And once I get it in sync, I delete the uh, audio track off the mm -hmm. the movies themselves and uh, just run with with the uh, master audio track from that point on. And then it's just spending the day deciding, okay, from here to here, I'll use this camera. We're here to here, you know, I'll switch to that camera. So I'm basically the three camera tracks are stacked. I use Camtasia for the video processing. Mm. That's, uh, that's one I learned how to use at the company I worked for because I was okay. doing training videos for them in the last couple of years. And so that's where my expertise was. So when I retired, I bought another copy of it and kept running with it because it did everything I wanted it to. Does that allow you to it, show uh, two shots simultaneously if you want to side by side or? You know, even I'd three in a little patchwork if you wanted to. It's not designed to do that, but I can force it to do that, sort of. And basically, each each track, you set a size for it and then mm -hmm. position it. So if I know the whole screen is taking up that much space, if I want to do simultaneous, like two views simultaneously, separate, like like what we're doing here in Zoom, I can have one video and just shrink it down to half the size and drag it to one side. The other video I'll drag down the same size and move it off to the other side and then it'll be side by side uh but the way it does the only time that generates problems for me is if i'm i can do the zooming in and out in post edit basically so if i want to zoom in on a you know something i'm doing on one keyboard or whatever yeah. you know, instead of having the wide shot all the time i can zoom in but if i if i do that for a video that's been cut down in size it grows as you zoom in <laughs> so no, that may not can, necessarily be depending on what you want to do that that might may yeah. or may not work yeah and I, i've done that i've got like we did a i did a video for my church where uh, i played a couple of keyboard parts and i had another family doing the, doing the singing which is something i generally don't do if i do i sing bass and i've got about a four note range so somewhat yeah limited. same here not not bass but, but four note range but uh so i actually did sing bass in this one particular one but so i had one shot of just me doing the singing i'd two other shots of me playing two different keyboards. And then I had a third shot where this family was all together. So they were all in the same room. So it helped me with the editing a bit because I didn't have to worry about their levels and making everything else match. So I, so I had them in one window 
my two keyboards and two windows and me and a fourth window Oh, okay. and keeping them all synchronized and together. And then I had other things where I was showing the, the words to the song across the middle and you know, whatever. So it was basically became a typical zoom style, you know, COVID performance with yeah. different people in different places, all getting married and post edit to, to make the final product. So I was able to pull it off, but it was, uh, you know, there's probably stuff out there that does a better job. This is really designed for business software where you're, you know, you can integrate PowerPoint presentations seamlessly mm. and put text and special effects wherever you want, you know, to zoom text in or out or have it jump around. You know, like the logo I do with get somebody at the beginning is all Camtasia presets. Oh, that, okay. Uh, I mean, that, but, I, uh, I, I was impressed with your logo. I forgot to mention that. I, I like that little splash. I, I'm all about the splash logo thing. If, if you might have noticed. <laughs> yeah. And I, it was probably yours that t convinced me I should probably do something similar because previously I just had the, you know, get so many music presents and it took a while to go in and on. Oh, okay. I'm still using pieces of that, but yeah, uh, I figure, okay, I'll have like 10 seconds, just get so many boom. Okay. Now you know where you are. And then if I have text, yeah, coming exactly. In, I, I like to set the tone. Yeah. With the, with the, with something like that. So. So the last half dozen videos or so probably have that in it. It's somewhere in mid COVID that that was introduced. So sometime last summer, but uh, I, I think I used yours as, Hey, that looks kind of cool. Uh, so I took my logo and did something similar. And you now th there's a bunch of people doing the, you know, the quick synthesizer, you know, boom, sweep, whatever. Mm, yeah. So, so I, so I had my own, uh, own version of that. Yep. Which I think I got, uh, that was a Moog one. Sound. Okay. I think it's I think it's actually one of Jamie's presets. Oh, it sounds so, good. Uh, I like like the sound there. Yep. So I popped that in for just to do the transition off that one. So uh, yeah. So that's basically how all that works. But uh, so I've kind of locked in now on the seasonal thing. So I've done winter and spring. Mm. So, so now I'm thinking about summer, but I'm really in no rush because yeah, I'm it's going to be a while. Kick in first. <laughs> So I don't know if I should space it out or just do the whole series, you know. Yeah, you could do or... like a spring part two or, you know, just make little subdivides, something yep. like that. So, so yeah, I got to I gotta figure that out. But uh, so that's what's banging around in the back of my head. But I, I'm not yeah. sure when that'll be. I'm probably going to, uh, where we're moving the clocks forward, you know, I, I did a premiere for the first time when, when uh, Spring Forward came out. But, uh, you know, it's on a weekday at noon Eastern time. So half the world is either at work or asleep, Yeah, you know, depending on the time zone. So, But I got a few people in there. I mean, it was, it was interesting. I'm not sure I'll do that anymore. But I think I'd have better kickoffs, really, when it just shows up and I release it. You know, what I think happened is that I issued the thing saying, hey, tune in tomorrow at noon mm. Eastern. When, th when this happens, I got like 90 hits on that. But I only had like three people come back at noon to do it. <laughs> Yeah. So I think if I just release it and say, hey, you know, Moog, uh, Moog One Group or Pro Synth Group or, you know, the Synth Show Group or, you know, whatever I'm doing this week's group, you know, I release that simultaneously and say, hey, here it is. And that's usually how I get my draw. So uh, that's probably where I'll, I'll go back to doing that because it seems to work better. You know, they still do okay overall, but uh, yeah, this, this was actually a slower start because, uh, probably because of the premiere mm. but, yeah uh, i haven't I, th I think i did one of those a while ago but uh, you know it's 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 all explorations you kind of try a few things see what works well and i, I would imagine you'd want to you get a, you'd you'd a schedule followers, it ahead I think of time good. yeah and, uh, and i think once you've got you know like jamie has ten thousand followers yeah, or whatever that changes everything know, on, on his channel you know that probably works really well at that point because you you can depend on you know enough people showing up to to see it and then you can do that and i, I did it mostly just to see what it does because i hadn't done one before so yeah. it's kind of cool you know it comes out there it says this is going to premiere in two hours and 10 minutes and yeah and then you can and, uh, and chat with two people. minutes beforehand yeah we had chat going there were a few people in and out there and i, get, I did get a couple new subscribers so that, oh, yeah, that did good. its job in that aspect but uh you know it's uh it was cool like at, at noon it kicked in and had like i don't know it's like a 60 second timer or whatever you know to count down so it looked like a test pattern with the numbers 
clicking okay. off, you know, and then hit zero and then screen cleared and the video started, you know, so, you know, it's a nice dramatic effect, but it's a lot more dramatic if you had like 300 people instead of three, knowing that two of them are me. Yeah. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> So I had it on the big screen so I could see it and hear it. And I usually have the, the iPad at the same time. So that's what I use to chat with or, or with the iMac, one of the two. But I can't type on my TVs, which is what I usually watch the, Okay. You know, if I'm watching Jamie's show, I'll have it on the big screen so I can just sit back and relax and watch it. Yeah. But I'll have the laptop or an iPad on my, on my lap so I can type, you know, with the crowd. Yeah. I got to be able to uh, give people a hard time every now and then on the, on the chat there. And we, I think we work well together because I think we both have the get off, get off my lawn attitude. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm always trying to tone it down because I, I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want to give anybody a hard time, but at the same time, got to be honest, like, well, it, uh, either like, like it or you don't like it. And I appreciate people being straightforward with me. So. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Now, people watch the show and they go, wow, oh, that's a nice show. But you know, if they're not looking at the live chat, they're not seeing <laughs> yeah. anything. Because the real show is going off in the chat window. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a, a free-for-all Lord of the Flies. It's it's pretty exciting. Um, so, Brian, if, if uh, folks want to find find your work, see what you're up to, get in touch with you, what are some ways they can do that? Yeah, let's see. I'm really in about three places. And let's see, I can probably show you. If I can yeah, I think you had some links queued up there. thing again. Let's see. Which is big enough that I could see what was going on here. It would be even better. Uh, let's see. I think it's in here. So let's try that. All right. So this is my YouTube channel, Get So Many Music. And uh just search for Get So Many Music when you find the purple uh, olive tree. And I've tree. noticed that's spelled a little different than the the normal Gethsemane spelling, I think. I, it threw me off at first. Okay, so here here's the story that goes with Get So Many Music. Uh, Get So Many Music was started uh, a few years back, and I'm actually an ASCAP publisher. And the way it came to be is my son is the real musician of the family, uh, but he took on guitar. And he started a band in Cincinnati called the Harlequins. Uh, it's been over 10 years now. And he is super talented, uh, both as a guitarist. He writes all his own music. They, uh, you know, normally they don't play covers, except on Halloween, they might transform into another band and just do that band's covers. They've been the Beatles before. Uh, they were uh, Ziggy Stardust one year, uh, Velvet Underground one year, I think. And uh, most recently, uh, it was Harry Nilsson. And his, he'll do a whole set of covers. And those, those are all buried in this channel somewhere. Okay. Uh, earlier on. So if you want to check that out, they're in mm -hmm. there. And, uh, but he was starting, he was, he's a copious songwriter. He's publishing all kinds of junk. And I figured uh, he was learning the music business at the same time I was really. This is probably back around 2003 or four or something like that. Yeah. So he started, we both registered with ASCAP. He is the composer and songwriter. And so anything he writes for his band gets published uh, under the jurisdiction of ASCAP. So if it ever becomes world famous, uh, we can both retire again. Yeah. Uh, and uh, back in the old days, they used to use you know, radio station surveys before everything was uh, converted to electronic and digital. So at the very first uh, uh, royalty check we got uh, came from a Napster download of one of his songs uh, just once and uh, it got caught in a sample and the way the ASCAP samples work back then you know if you're on a radio station that's they figured if you if they caught you on a random survey on this radio station you were probably on a bunch of radio stations so mm -hmm. they would kind of amortize it out based on what they thought the total you know number of views would be but it was totally a wild guess yeah. so for this one one survey that caught the one song being downloaded by Napster they cut us both a check, me as the publisher, him as the uh, writer for like 160 bucks. Wow. And uh, that was awesome. <laughs> That's the only one of those checks we ever got. Yeah. Uh, some, somewhere in the last 10 years, they've converted everything to digital and now they track yeah. everything. Yeah. I've actually got copyright strikes on the, the Halloween videos where they're playing 
uh, like the Beatles music or a couple of the Ziggy Stardust songs, uh, that they did it good enough that the uh, algorithm that we're all fighting for the F- FFS mm-hmm. challenge the other last month, uh, put a copyright claim on it from ASCAP saying, hey, this belongs to uh, yeah, ASCAP. <laughs> so I'm, I'm fighting that one as Gethsemane Music ASCAP saying, hey, guys, I'm the publisher. I put it there. Thank you. I'm not yeah. monetizing, and I appreciate you grabbing that. And someday I'll get my eight tenths of a, of a cent for it. But yep. uh, if I ever do monetize, I'd like to get all of it. <laughs> so, stop copyright protecting my own stuff. You know, even if the intent and it is registered with you, but I'm the publisher, and I put it there. So I have my own permission to put it there. <laughs> so stop trying to steal my money, because by the time they filter it through, you know it goes down right now it takes about ten thousand views to uh to make a cent (laughs) yeah pretty brutal i can can pull up a report that'll show we got like uh 400 plays and uh and it's mostly his stuff i've got a few of mine in there now too it's like the the two seasonal things i published under ascap in case somebody uses them in a movie someday you never know i'd like to get rich again so i can buy more cents but uh you know, whatever it's out there. It is what it is. But I think I'm making about uh, it would average out to about between a dollar to a dollar and a half a month on royal on royalties. Yeah. And that's when things are going good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so we'll see. Seven hundred more subscribers, and maybe I can start doing something on YouTube and get another twenty cents. But uh, anyway, it's out there on the on get so many music, and uh, so I started out as a publisher and. We're talking about the spelling and the story. So Oliva is an Italian name and it means olive. And uh, I was trying to figure out how to tie all this together. So I do have a kind of a Christian background. So, and you know, my stuff is basically clean. You won't find any crazy modern day lyrics that will blow people out of the water. So I decided, okay, so Oliva means olive. So my logo is going to be an olive tree. So I found this thing somewhere and turned it purple and said, okay, so that's the Get 70 Music logo. Now, how would you tie Oliva and olive to something? Well, the Garden of Gethsemane was an olive grove. So, uh, okay, so we'll call it Get 70 Music. And then I started looking around and Get 70 spelled in English was already taken pretty much everywhere. Yeah. But, it, but Get 70 spelled in Italian oh. wasn't. So I said, huh, okay. Oliva is Italian for olive. So get somebody spelled without the H. The way it shows there is get somebody spelled in Italian. So that ties together. And they both tie back to olives. And there you go. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So, that's very clever. So that's the background story. And yeah, you know, it's kind of drifted away from just being a publisher. Now I. I'm almost thinking that if I didn't have to re-register 10,000 websites, I'd, I'd call it Gethsemane Media if I was doing it today. Oh, yeah. Because I now have the capability of doing you know, digital conversions. You know, you've mm-hmm. got a VHS tape you want turned into a, a DVD, and a DVD you want converted to MP4. I can do all that. So that would be part of it. You know, I do my own video production, uh, do my own sound recording. Uh, originally Get Somebody Music was also a recording studio, and that's where the band, in the same room I use this as studio now for 10 years, my son's band was practicing down there. Hmm. And anything they recorded was you know, coming out of there as well. So uh, that's how it started. And then that computer kind of blew up and took Pro Tools with it. So uh, that was the end of the recording studio. But then oh boy, eventually he uh, moved out. I think he was 30-something at that point, but that was okay. We, we had a lot of fun up to that point and uh, he really got good at his music and I got much better at learning how to record stuff. So, you know, it was a mutual, mutually beneficial uh, learning experience there. But as soon as all his got stuff, all his stuff got taken out, I started adding my stuff back in. So all the stuff I wanted when I was in a band, when I was his age, you know, yeah. as a teenager that I never had money for, that's when the room started to fill up. <laughs> so, uh, that's been the evolution of it all. So, and uh, do you have a? Looks like you've got a Facebook as well. Yeah. Or, so, uh, uh, okay. Also there got you the go. Get seventy music dot com is the website. Okay. And that, that probably has the story of the, how the name got founded. Uh, also links to the Facebook page. 
Uh, the videos are all here as well, but they're uh, sorted into categories here. We're on YouTube. They're just sort of in chronological order. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for tutorials, there's a section for that. Go down a little bit. You got Mog One demos, and this goes on for a while. So uh, music videos and yeah. tutorials wow. and all kinds of all kinds of stuff. So uh, that's all in there, and then the Facebook page as well. Uh, with the uh, current studio showing <laughs> that, that, that's that's fantastic <laughs> so uh that's all in there and, yeah and uh that's the three places uh, okay and if you uh if you follow either youtube or facebook you'll get tied into all the youtube stuff one way or another so uh, whatever you're most comfortable with you will find me there yeah and i'll i'll put links to all that down in the description of this video so People won't have too hard of a time getting there. All right. Well, Brian, I uh, sure appreciate you having a chat with me. It was uh, fun learning about your your backstory and seeing all those that different piece of equipment. And I'm uh, glad to hear your 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 studio is slowly being resurrected there. <laughs> yeah, at, at my age, I just hope you'll live long enough, you know, to see it all again. But. Uh... Or that I could still move after I haul all that stuff back downstairs. <laughs> I, I really need a road crew at this point because uh, those amps in particular yeah. don't really don't really go up and downstairs very well. <laughs> and uh, so far, I've been able to hang on, but it's uh, I might need new walls if anything gets loose. <laughs> so uh, if you have any volunteers, I'll uh, yeah PM me and I'll send you my address. We'll have a road crew come down here and move everything someday. I don't I don't trust the real movers to haul up yeah, that stuff down there. Yeah. Because I, I would like it to be in the condition it's in now when I get down there. Yeah, because, no uh, doubt. No doubt. All right. Well, um, yeah, it was a good good talking to you and uh hopefully we'll be able to have another another conversation in the future and pick up where we left off or go in a whole different direction. But all uh, right. yeah, it's been fun. Okay. Thank you very well, much, thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me, and uh, we'll catch you next time around. Stay tuned. All righty. Bye for now, folks.